This was for you, King. I've got the Goku shirt on, I got a beer in my hand, which means that you know exactly what time it is. Now, a while back, I did reviews on all three of the Dragon Ball Z Budokai games, which, honestly, held up way better than I expected, especially for games from that era. But there was a natural course of progression with those games. Each one went a little further in an attempt to better mimic the anime they were based off of. Well, also still trying to be fun and interesting fighting games. Which is hard. It's really dang hard. I really commend them for that, because trying to put the fast, frantic action of Akira Toriyama's steroid-fueled magnum opus into the confines of a somewhat competitive fighting game is not an easy task to do. But that's the thing, the, the Budokai games were more fighting games than they were Dragon Ball Z games. They were essentially just Tekken, but good, and in orange jammies, which is fine, but besides some small details, they didn't really scream Dragon Ball Z, and Dragon Ball Z is all about the screaming. And this is where Budokai Tenkaichi comes in. Budokai Tenkaichi absolutely screams Dragon Ball. You could fly anywhere, fight anywhere, blow up uh, anywhere. All in glorious 3D. Want to slam a man in the face so hard that his grandchildren's cousin's dog will feel it? Do it, man. You can literally just throw all of the hands. Every hand that you could potentially throw, you can throw it. This game came out in 2005, hot off the heels of the massive success of Dimp's Budokai 3. Bandai handed the reins over to Spike, who mostly published games made by other developers, most notably the Fire Pro Wrestling series, and I, I guess Dengen Ronpa? I, I've never played that one, maybe I should at some point though. Budokai Tenkaichi promised us a whole heck of a lot, being touted as the ultimate Dragon Ball Z game, and wouldn't you know it, it's not very good. Like, it's fine, I guess, and it looks the part, but it feels very... off. Thankfully, though, a lot of suckers bought into the hype, and it got a much better sequel in 2006 on both the PS2 and the Wii. And this is more like it. This game absolutely delivered on the promise of being the ultimate Dragon Ball game allowing you to fly and freely explore the wonderful world and characters that Mr. Toriyama so lovingly made. So, how do you improve on something that is literally damn near perfect? Well, you just get rid of that pesky 2 on there, you slap a 3 on that bitch, paint it green, and inject it with every steroid known to man, and some known only to 5th dimensional imps. Budokai Tenkaichi 2 was already the game they promised us the first time, but then Spike came in with their massive testicles carted in a wheelbarrow and went, Yo, we ain't even done, bitches. And in 2007, they launched Budokai Tenkaichi 3 on the PS2 and the Wii, and this was both the best and worst thing that they could have ever done. Uh, the best, because this game is fucking awesome. The worst, because there is no possible way they can actually follow up on this. Yeah, no, BT3 is the peak. It's the best Dragon Ball Z game. Hell, it's the best game based off of an anime. Everything about BT3 shows that the developers not only perfectly understood Dragon Ball, to a near autistic level, might I add, but understood it to the point where they could just make a game that accurately simulated it, while also being a legitimately good fighting game. Now, it's been a while since I've actually played BT3, with this time being the first time in, uh, oh, damn near 20 years. Do you feel old yet? Budokai 3 turns 20 this year. Man, remember being fucking 11 and playing that? I don't. I didn't play it until I reviewed it, and I regret that. Greatly. Almost as much as my parents regret my existence. And going into this review, I'm going to level with you, as I frequently do. I already knew exactly how I felt prior to writing the review. This game's fucking excellent. It 
transcends time. That is how good it is. Now, enough of me telling you how good it is. Here's a video of me explaining how good it is. We'll go over the modes later on, but for right now, I want to discuss the roster of Budokai Tenkaichi 3. Budokai 3 was the biggest roster in Dragon Ball Z game history at the time with an astounding 43 fighters. Which, I mean, doesn't really sound like a lot, but when you think about modern fighting games launching with about half of that, yeah, 43 sounds pretty damn impre- Tenkaichi 3 has 161. Yeah, you did mishear that. If somebody threw a punch in any episode of Dragon Ball, it's pretty likely that they're here. This is the second biggest roster in any fighting game ever made. And the first is Tobol number two. And if I had a nickel for every fighting game with character designs by Akira Toriyama that had the biggest roster in fighting game history, I would have two nickels. Uh, which really, in the grand scheme of things, is not a lot. But how the fuck did that happen twice? Now, technically, you could say it's 98. The game does cheat a little bit to get that number up, but it does it in a rather clever way. See, there's three versions of Adult Goku. Each one has access to different moves, transformations, etc., but each transformation actually does play differently, almost to a wild extent. Super Saiyan 3 Goku does not play like Super Saiyans 1 or 2, so technically, while yeah, it's the same guy, it's a vastly different playstyle to the point where I could understand someone liking to play as base or Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta over, say, Super Vegeta. And there's also some deep fucking cuts in this roster. We have pretty much every main character, yeah, even Chaozu's here! He was seen in a single cutscene of Budokai 1, I am pretty sure this is the very first time Chaozu was ever playable was in the Tenkaichi games. <laughs> uh, we got the entire Ginyu Force, a bunch of movie characters, fucking Tambourine. Two flavors of Tao Pai Pai, even Arale is present and accounted for. Also, uh, just, just throwing this out there, but can we get more characters from non-Dragon Ball related Toriyama works in Dragon Ball games? Like, seriously, Namco. Get cozy with Square Enix for a second. Like, let's get Chrono in Xenoverse 2. I, I don't care if it doesn't make sense for him to fly. It just saves me the time of having to make him myself. And because you haven't heard me gush about this enough, you can even play as characters in their great ape forms, even if they never appeared in the show. Nappa, Raditz, Kid Goku, Turles, even Vegeta's dad, who keeps his beard! We could play as the most suave ape in the galaxy. Holy shit, that's funny. We've got three whole ass Frieza grunts, and for whatever reason, this guy is just Frieza soldier. The hell is that? Every character's name has a trademark for some reason. Like, oh, you guys trademarked Goku? Shit. We better tell the guy that translated Journey to the West into Japanese. Gohan literally means rice. It literally means rice. How can you trademark rice? Like, I get what they mean. That specific usage of Piccolo is copyrighted. So, I can't just make a comic or a show or a game or whatever and make a big green legally safe Martian Manhunter with that name, but like it's it's kind of intrusive and annoying and you never see other fighting games do that like imagine if Capcom did that with Street Fighter like now you just can't have a guy named Ken that wears red and whose wife left him because he invested in the wrong cryptocurrency although there was that one time where he had his name changed for the toy because Mattel thought that people would confuse him for another Ken and we don't need anybody teaching Barbie how to spam DPs on Wake Up. But hey, you know, if this is all I can bitch and complain about this far into the video, clearly the game is doing something right. And it absolutely is. Once we get to the gameplay, this might seem like a standard run-of-the-mill 3D anime arena fighter, which, that was a lot of words, but that assessment could not be more wrong. The key difference between Tenkaichi 3 and, uh, oh, let's just throw out, uh, any of the My Hero Academia games. 
is momentum. Each of your attacks actually pushes you and the opponent forward, providing this sense of an actual struggle and not just two action figures slamming into each other. You actually have a lot of control over your attacks too, being able to launch opponents up, down, left or right at will. This provides the player with a ton of freedom, making this less of a fighting game and more of a sandbox for you to just completely fuck up. That being said, it's also a damn good fighting game. That's way, way more technical than some would think or even expect from a Dragon Ball Z game. This game even has mix-ups, like the, you know, big boy fighting games that you see at major events, like EVO, since you can attack high or low, forcing your opponent to block in that direction to avoid getting hit by a big, meaty, thick combo. Oh, and those levels that have a lot of shit to break? Uh, they've got a lot of shit to break. Buildings, mountains, trees, a truck. No planes, though, so we can't replicate that time that Nappa totally didn't kill those pilots because Tien, with his three fucking eyes, saw their fucking parachutes. There's even nighttime stages, which allow certain Saiyan characters to transform into their great ape forms, and unlike Budokai, the transformations last as long as you fucking want them to. Yeah, no getting out of SSJ because you just, you know, didn't sit there trying not to shit your pants. The keyword of this game is freedom. You have all of the freedom. So much goddamn freedom. In a lot of ways, Tenkaichi 3 reminds me a lot of UFC 3, in that UFC 3 was about making you feel like you're actually fighting. Tenkaichi 3 makes you feel more like you're actually an angry space monkey man throwing hands with a stretchy green guy. The game doesn't make you feel like you're playing a game, but rather engaged in these high-octane kung fu super fights with massive energy beams and sick-as-fuck combos. And the controls demonstrate that really damn well. You string together combos with Y, which can also lead into heavy smash attacks if you end your combo with a press of the X button. The L and R shoulder triggers control your altitude, while A blocks your face from face punches. And B is your fast as fuck boy button. And unlike Budokai, which required motion inputs for charging, Tenkaichi just maps it to ZL, which is way more efficient. And just like Budokai 3, this game also has beam struggles, which are not only way cooler, but are also more likely to destroy your fucking analog sticks. I have lost so many fucking controllers to this game. But here's the catch. I'm not playing the PS2 version for this review. I'm playing the Wii version. And with it being the Wii, I also have to talk about the alternate less good control options. On the Wii, you have three different controllers you can play with. While the classic controller offers a similar experience to the PS2 version, and the GameCube controller is just a slightly worse version of that, playing with a Wii Remote Nunchuck is both the coolest fucking thing ever, and the most frustrating fucking thing ever. For whatever reason, I couldn't seem to get combos that I knew on the regular controller to come out. It doesn't look like they truncated the move list to make up for this control style, but the timing feels off and different, and many times just mashing A will make your smash attacks come out anyways, so you don't really need to learn the combos. The D-pad is also used for charging, which sounds stupid, but not so stupid that it can't be used for later games in the franchise that aren't on the Wii. Wait, what the fuck is that? And with this being the Wii, obviously, some sort of motion controls have to be included. And, to be perfectly honest with you, they're awesome. Uh, let me rephrase that. They're fucking awesome. We've all done it. If you say you've never spiked your hair up in the shower and pretended to go Super Saiyan or just randomly threw out a Kamehameha while doing the motion when you thought nobody was around, you're lying. And now, that weird little habit actually has a practical use. Sometimes. It's definitely slow and not really ideal, but damn if it isn't cool or fun to do. And really, that's the point of a video game. I find it weird that I have to say that, but while the Wiimote Nunchuck isn't the best way to play the game, it is the most fun. Initiating a beam clash is definitely a bitch though, because a lot of times I would just get hit. Until I realized that you don't need to hold down the D-pad to throw out a move, you can just, you can just throw it out. 
And the beam struggles are, uh, <laughs> they're definitely a thing with the Wiimote. I sure hope I don't look fucking stupid doing this. And the only issue I have with the gameplay is that maybe some of the roster is a bit samey. Even worse, a lot of them are just not good to play as. Like, I can't see any reason to ever play as Kid Chi Chi, Android 8, or Dr. We Dr. Wheelow? Really? He's here? Who the fuck invited that guy? And yet, fan favorite characters like Hachiak and Azoto had to wait until fucking Dragon Ball Heroes to get even a minor crumb of recognition. Like, who doesn't know who Azoto is? You mean to tell me that you never played the arcade exclusive Dragon Ball Z themed Punch Out clone that nearly got a port on the 3DO? Are you stupid? Are you even a real fan at that point? Okay. Jokes aside, the fact that the 3DO nearly got a Dragon Ball Z game while the N64's only anime game was that dog shit Evangelion game astounds me to no end. Pretty much everyone from OG Dragon Ball sucks to play as, mostly because they can't fly, which is fine because, you know, save for my man Roshi, I don't really play as them. Fun fact, Master Roshi is actually my favorite character. Uh, yeah, he's a bit of a goofball, and yeah, okay, he's a creep, but he's jacked as fuck. He is the guy who can slap your girl's ass and then dare you to fucking do something about it. In fact, he won't just stop at her ass, he'll grab your ass too. I'll only do the latter. Like, what fucking use are you ever going to get out of Devil Man? What's he gonna do, just rip off Android 18's tits and eat them while she bleeds out on the floor? I... may have gotten him mixed up with another Devil Man. But I mean, what are the chances that there's two anime characters out there, both called Devil Man? <laughs> that would... that would be weird! That would be... that would be a copyright nightmare! Nobody would be able to figure them out, get them straight, or anything of the sort. <laughs> it's, it's like having two guys named Goku. It just... Pandemonium! Insanity, even! But actually, some of the weaker characters do have use. Devilman actually has a beam that deals more damage based on how... Oh, boy. Based on how evil his opponent is. And today on Shit I Never Expected to Say, a fighting game that takes into account the morality of its roster. I mean, hey, if Mortal Kombat 9 has a meta based around every fighter's breathing habits, why not? And there is a ton of this kind of shit. Like, if your opponent's power level is canonically higher than yours, your punches won't make them flinch but transform, and suddenly this tower of muscle will go down harder than his voice actor's defamation case. Or just pick a Raleigh, who's cute as fuck, barely flinches, hits like a fucking truck, and causes even the burliest of motherfuckers to think twice about playing who can punch the softest. There is so much attention to detail in damn near everything in this game. Like, Goku's hair looks different based on how it looked in the anime at the time. I'm shocked they didn't include a movie version of Goku that makes the game run at 60 frames per second. Also, just like the Budokai games, this game allows you to customize each character to a certain degree. Unlike Budokai though, uh, not the moves. So it's just passives and stat buffs. You can do shit like make Hercule hit like Mike Tyson or turn Goldo into a defensive monster or even just simple things like making it so that Master Roshi can fly. You also get a password for each character which is, of course, needlessly long, allowing you to share your custom fighters with the friends that you totally have. Also, there are broken-as-fuck Red Patara versions of each character that equips them with items you can't normally get. This is great if you have that one friend that treats you like shit over, but your mom forced you to go to his birthday party that year despite the fact that he never went to yours, while some other kid you didn't really know picked up the slack and you kind of bonded as much as you could in a single afternoon while playing through Mega Man 2 with them! But enough of hearing me gush over how good the gameplay and the attention to detail is. Now, here's a couple minutes of me just gushing about the sheer amount of fucking content. I review boxing and MMA games. I am not used to this. Having modes beyond just career and versus blows my tiny fucking mind. 
drives me fucking insane. This game has a lot. For starters, story mode, basic Dragon Ball Z story, we're told for the thousandth time, but now we've got GT and OG series shit. BT2 had this really cool semi-open world RPG mode where you went around exploring, leveling up, and fighting stronger enemies while hunting down the Dragon Balls, and this is just menus. Menus with cutouts sliding across. Oh, okay, look. If you want to make a Dragon Ball visual novel, just make one, okay? I, I won't judge you, Namco Bandai. I mean, I, I will, but not for that. The whole story mode just feels lazy and slapped together, which coming hot off the heels of Budokai Tenkaichi 2 is evident. Like, they blew their whole load just on that game, then didn't really feel like doing something similar with this one. It's not terrible, but it's clear just where the effort was. Each saga also has a character guiding you through it, and then ends when they pass the torch off to someone else, which is treated with the same amount of fanfare as when a very special guest shows up on screen in a bad 90s sitcom. Almost like Vegeta is just Piccolo's weird, kooky neighbor who's always coming up with get-rich-quick schemes. Besides the story mode, we also have Ultimate Battle, which is where we'll find Sim Dragon, a mode that honestly perplexes me. It's probably the worst thing about this game. You're given a limited amount of energy, then spend 10 in-game days training and sleeping to boost your stats in preparation for an upcoming fight against a randomly selected opponent. And honestly, while I think this could be cool, a lot of your stat buffs are decided by the absolute worst dice rolls. Almost like playing a game of D&D, but the DM cursed your dice. Overall, I didn't spend much time in this mode, it, it didn't really interest me, but I'd like to see it more in-depth in a later game at some point. I think having to manage your fighter's training, sleep schedule, and all of that could be kind of fun. It just isn't here. But on top of that, we also have Mission 100, which is essentially just event match from Smash Bros. You have a bunch of fights, all with different variables and win conditions, and they're actually pretty fun. It's not as wild as Smash's version with, like, you know, giant Donkey Kongs or that fucking fight against Giga Bowser, but it's still kind of neat. It offers a lot of challenge that the main game doesn't, and I like that. The last in this menu is survival. It's just a basic survival mode. Enjoy it. The last major mode is World Tour. This is where you'll find the World Tournament, as well as a couple other variations of it. It does do this weird thing where it's on this sort of timer, so you can't just pick what version you want to play, and instead have to wait for it to go down before a different type of tournament becomes selectable. But if you don't want to wait, you can just go to free mode, uh, but you don't get any sort of reward for your efforts. Each variation of tournament offers something new. World Tournament is your standard tournament, with only the World Tournament stage. Which obviously means ringouts are in effect and are even more annoying than ever here. The knockback is heavily reduced on this map though, but you're still more likely to win or lose by ringout. Sometimes, the opponent will even just fly into the wall, netting you a free win. Big tournament is is just it's just that, only you know it's it's big. That's it, that's the difference. It's it's just bigger. Cell Games has survival mode rules and only occurs on the Cell Games Arena. Other World Tournament allows you to play on any stage, and unfortunately there is no other World Tournament arena, uh, which would have been uh you know, awesome. But no, we got we gotta make do with what we've got. Uh, you can play as any character, but the stage itself is always random. But then we have the biggest tournament, the Yamcha Games, which randomly selects a fighter for you. You could get lucky and land on someone like Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, which my cat definitely approves of, or you could be like me and have to fight as Garlic Jr which is like having to ice skate uphill. And of course, the tournament ends with you fighting the man himself, and I... I couldn't beat Yamcha. I could beat Metacooler and, and Baby, but... not Yamcha. Lastly, we have Duel, which is your standard versus mode. You actually can mess around with it a fair bit, with options for the timer, announcer, you can even toggle destructible environments and transformations on or off. There's even a goddamn tag mode, allowing for large-scale 5-on-5 five -five battles. Suck it, Dragon Ball Fighters. I, I joke, but that game's actually pretty awesome. Even my cat agrees. It's also the only mode where you can 
actively trigger fusions. You can also save replays of your matches here, so if you manage to do some cool shit, you can show it to your friends to prove that you actually did beat Red Patara Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta with Chi-Chi. And at this point, you might be thinking, I haven't seen you take a sip of that beer yet. But you've also already gone over the story mode, the tournaments, the versus mode. What else is there? This game couldn't possibly have more content. It does. Yeah. Oh yeah. This game doesn't fucking stop there, it goes deeper. Dragon Balls Deep. One being the online. Yeah, this was actually the very first Dragon Ball Z game to ever offer online multiplayer. Only on the Wii. Which, I mean, is known for nothing if not its prowess at handling online games. Especially fighting games. I mean, who needs consistency? And I actually did play this online back in the day. It wasn't great. It was your typical Nintendo Wi-Fi connection experience with loads of input lag and dropped matches. And gauging from my experience with the Xenoverse games, not much has changed. I feel like this is more of a Bandai Namco issue than a Nintendo one. But the other is character reference. Normally, I wouldn't dedicate a whole section of a review for this, but it's honestly a pretty good place to start if you're new to Dragon Ball. Here you can do things like read about your favorite characters, view their models and various outfits, which even reference shit that doesn't actually exist. You can even find out who voices who, except for those times where it's wrong. But most importantly, you can hear just how much of a total judgmental bitch Chi Chi is. Can't judge a book by its cover. Even a polite delinquent's a delinquent. This is Trunks' powered-up form. Those muscles are abnormal. Like, Jesus, Goku. Dump this broad. Don't settle for that negativity, King. You're better than that. But... Boy... There's actually... Even... More... The thing with good Dragon Ball games... Is that... People really... Stick to them. Like, to an autistic level. It wasn't often that we got good Dragon Ball games, but when it happened, it was huge. And Dragon Ball Z fans absolutely told you about it. And much like every game ever made by Bethesda, except Starfield, Budokai Tenkaichi 3 has a massive modding community keeping the game alive. And some of them are just, you know, stupid things. Let's add let's add Thomas the Tank Engine and have him fuse with Goku. Oh, shit like that. But somebody made a whole ass Tenkaichi 4. Yes, they pulled a Thanos while waiting for Namco Bandai to bring out their own and said, "Fine, we'll do it ourselves." And made a I shit you not sequel by fans not even getting paid this mod looks fucking great they added a whole new intro new mechanics expanded the story and roster to include events and characters going right up until superhero they changed how the menus look even went so far as to include whole ass new costumes for damn near the entire roster if you've played Tenkaichi 3 to death, I highly recommend checking out this mod. Team BT4 did a great job. If it wasn't already kind of clear, I love this game. I love it. With every, every inch of my being, every molecule in my heart, every... Every blood cell that's going through my veins. I actually went into this review thinking there was no way that it was as good as I remembered it. I was I was likely just looking at it through Super Saiyan Rose tinted goggles. 
And honestly, it's even better than I remembered. It's like bumping into an old friend that you haven't seen in years, catching up, and discovering that they are just as awesome as when you were kids. Everything about this game is amazing. The fast-paced action, the attention to detail, everything about Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3 helps make this the best, most satisfying game in the entire franchise. And that's why I have no choice but to give this over 9,000 out of 5. It's so good that 17 years after it came out, we're still talking about it. That doesn't happen to a lot of games, and especially not licensed anime games. There's been so many over the years that they all kind of just blend together, but then there's this one that comes out, and 17 years later, we're still talking about how much ass it kicks. This could have been the very last Dragon Ball Z game, and everyone would have been content. We all would have been happy. What else can you do to improve on this? It has to go up from here. It's an absolute classic, both as a Dragon Ball Z game and as a solid 3D fighting game. Really makes you wish that Bandai Namco would, you know, get off their asses and just make a new Budokai Tenkaichi. But, uh, what's the chances of that ever happening? Slim to zero. Hey, uh, I just want to thank you for watching the review. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, this game was a lot of fun to play through, and it felt like a massive love letter to the biggest works of one of the biggest creative minds of our times, Akira Toriyama. Even as a kid, I always found his art interesting, even if I didn't think I'd like the game itself all that much, the way he drew characters, it always, always caught my eye. Everything from Dragon Quest to Dr. Slump, Chrono Trigger, heck, it's why I gave Blue Dragon a try back when that game came out. And a lot of those things have become some of my favorite games and manga, uh, especially Chrono Trigger. That is a fantastic game, easily one of my favorite RPGs of all time. I, I don't even think that anime itself would have become as mainstream as it did. I don't think that we would be talking about it quite as much. Uh, we'd probably still be calling it Japanimation, uh, which <laughs> shows my age. Um, Dragon Ball is a show that we're really not supposed to know about. Like, no, no, really. We aren't actually supposed to know what it is. A bunch of companies tried to bring it over to the West during the late 80s and 90s, and damn near all of them failed. And not because of the quality, but more to do with the fact that we had this notion over here that animation's a kid's thing. But much like the series protagonist, it managed to overcome adversity, and... It became a staple in pop culture all over the world. His work made us laugh, it made us cry, it made us grit our teeth in anticipation as we waited for the next episode. I legitimately don't think I've ever yelled, you've got to be fucking kidding me, at the end of an episode prior to watching Dragon Ball. Toriyama made us sympathize with characters that just an arc or two ago we were supposed to hate. He helped us realize that there's good in everyone. Nobody is irredeemable, no matter what. And that through hard work and determination, you can accomplish anything. And that you're, you're far more capable than you think you are. You can, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. This man instilled these positive messages into the hearts and minds of millions of people. He actively made our lives better just by drawing. He may not be here, but his work and the legacy he crafted will live on forever. Nothing ever dies. Thank you.